My crazy mother-in-law wants to get involved. That's not all. My brother-in-law, who I thought I could trust, completely turned his back on me, backstabbing and sabotaging me. My mother-in-law is now trying to take custody of my children, and I will do anything in this world to stop her. Hey, so y'all probably know me from my frequent postings about me and my husband's daily banter. Sadly, I've came here for something else today. Firstly, I would like to inform you that the daily post on our banter will be more as my husband recently passed. It's honestly a kinda hellish feeling I wouldn't wish on anyone. I didn't know losing him would feel the way that it does. As I expected it to some level, but it's a million times worse. Ever since that day, it felt as if someone has had their hand around me just continuously squeezing and suffocating me. He had a work-related accident while working overtime, and even though he was rushed to the hospital, his injuries were too severe and he ended up not making it. Getting the news from the doctor was one of the worst days of my life, because I honestly always thought my husband and I were that rare kind of love that just lasted forever. I thought he would see our kids growing up and grow old together, retiring in our beautiful little home, but still, that was taken away from us. The kids aren't taking it any better, and that's what hurts the most. Yeah, they were young, and they are less experienced with grieving, and they have had yet to fully grasp the situation, but I can see that they have some understanding of it, and it breaks my heart. Two days ago was the funeral. I was there, but at the same time, not... It felt as if I was just going through the motions, as if life was just passing me by. Everything I did felt like autopilot. Even now, writing this, it amazes me the level of awareness I have, even while still feeling so lost. The only time I was ever really pulled into the present and aware of the grieving mind was when my kids needed me, and I'm most grateful for that. It still hurts, though, trying to be strong for them, that's the thing with grief and having kids around. A lot of times you'll have to bury what you feel to keep them afloat and to show them that it's okay. To be the shoulder to cry on and the only one that they can rely with. That's what I did that day. Still, while the funeral went well, everything after was just downhill from there. After the funeral, I was preparing to rest absolutely exhausted mentally and physically, but my crazy mother-in-law decided to call a family meeting. Note that I and this woman never get along. She's always treating me coldly with scorn and despise, making it very obvious whenever we had it to be alone, but someone masking it whenever my husband was around. <laughs> In simple terms, she has always tolerated me but never liked me, don't know why, as she never made it clear. Still, knowing how unreasonable she could be, I decided to go along with the family meet to see what the heck was that grumpy old jerk's problem. Plus, also wanted to see what was so important it couldn't have waited even just a few days after my husband's funeral. I remember thinking as I sat with the other members that it would have been much better if she was the one dead. Not my husband. But I recalled the thought as soon as it came. Anyways, eventually the minute everyone was present and the first thing that came out of her mouth was that she wanted custody of the kids. Now, let me tell you I was so shocked it wasn't even hidden. I knew everyone could tell by my stunned expression I wasn't expecting that in the least little bit. Anyways... I asked her why she would want the kids, and I crap you not. She straight up said because she didn't want me killing them the way I killed her son. Well, now that was a double blow to me already screwed, grieving mind. Like I'd known deep down by the way that she had been treating me and looking at me since the passing of my husband that she blamed me for it. But I didn't think she would really say such a thing out loud. And because of how absurd it was, I actually rebutted her, and the whole argument ensued. To summarize a bit, she was blaming me for her son's death, saying how if he didn't have to save for a surprise family vacation he was planning, then he wouldn't have been working overtime, would he? 
which would have kept him from the accidental death, saying how I was no more than a gold digger, and how I'd pressured him into working extra shifts so that I could finance my lifestyle. I rebutted her many times, making it very clear that never once was I even made aware of the plans that he had, and also made it clear that I barely asked for anything, but nothing I said changed a thing. Essentially, she wanted control of the children. She wanted me to relinquish my custodial rights to her and my sister-in-law, Rachel. Well, she not only made claims of how I would hurt my children just as I hurt my husband, but also insulted me by saying even if they survive, they would grow up to be white. Because I have zero culture, and the last thing she wanted was to have grandchildren who are too white. As if my sister-in-law wasn't just as white as I was. I told her clearly that I would rather die than give her crazy abusive self-custody of my children because I knew the old witch never once liked or accepted my kids. She had always disliked them, treated them with the same contempt she had treated me with. I feared that with her crazy self she would harm them if I once allowed them to be around her because even my husband, while he was alive, had kept them away from her. And whenever they had to be around her, either he or I was always there to keep an eye on them because both of us knew she was not too right in the head. Anyways, eventually I made my decision clear, forcing her to drop the argument. When she left, I knew she wasn't satisfied because her face spoke volumes. Still, I thought that would be the end of it. So, imagine my surprise when I woke up to my rich brother-in-law ringing the life out of my doorbell the next day. I'd honestly open the door expecting to be greeted warmly, as he was the only member of my husband's family who had always treated me with love, care, and respect. Our relationship has always been good. Still, one look at his face and I could tell something was wrong and something had changed. He didn't seem friendly, instead his gaze was similar to his mother's, hateful and riddled with contempt. It honestly hurt, because grieving the death of my husband, while also losing one of the major emotional supports I had, was painful. Once I had let them in, he didn't even wait for me to ask any questions before he delivered his offer. It was simple. I would either give up custody of his nephews and niece to his mother and wife, crazy mother-in-law and jealous sister-in-law, or he would dissolve the trust fund he's made for them. At this point, I was absolutely shocked hearing those words. It honestly felt like getting sucker punched in the guts, because just as much as me and my husband had known of crazy mother-in-law's strong dislike for the kids and her abusive nature, brother-in-law also knew. He was even the one who warned us never to leave the kids alone with her, Yet there he was trying the exact opposite, barely even 48 hours since his brother's body had been put to rest. I wanted to argue, but with my children's future depending on the trust fund, I was honestly in a tight spot because that trust fund would decide the quality of life they'll live between now and some years into their adult future, as it was more than enough to send them away to college for multiple years Maybe even finance a business while still financing a rich lifestyle for all three of them. For a minimum of 20 years. So, I eventually agreed to share custody with crazy mother-in-law, but I refused to give it up completely. So it's been two days since the funeral now, and well, the kids will be staying over there for a week. Starting tomorrow. I just really hope it doesn't end up being a bad decision. Update number one. Well, so something terrifying occurred yesterday and I honestly still feel my heart clench and drop at the memory. As you may remember from the first update on my situation, the kids would spend a week at my crazy mother-in-law's place. Well, that did happen and it's been eight days since. Everything had gone as planned on the first day. Just as I planned, I'd pack the kids' stuff and drive them to their crazy mother-in-law's house which honestly took a lot out of me because I dreaded every single second, and I had all the right to. 
The minute that I drove up to mother-in-law's place, she had stood outside waiting. She didn't even greet me when she saw me. Instead, she put all her attention on the kids. She had seemed a bit too friendly towards the kids for my liking that day, but I knew there wasn't much I could even do about it. Once the kids had run off to play, I tried talking to her, but she just shut me down telling me she didn't want to hear crap about taking care of the children from a murderer. I was tempted to slap her right across the face, and I held back, knowing it would do me no good. My sister-in-law had made a couple of rude remarks too, and she'd always been at odds with me because she was just one jealous girl, always finding something to complain about. I had a feeling one of the reasons she never liked me is because I had a gift that she was never given. And that was the gift of fertility. I learned of her infertility only after I conceived Samish and Jaden. She had actually been kind to me up until the point. The reason she showed her true colors was that she had the audacity to ask if she could adopt Samish when she found out I was having twins. Saying how it would be beautiful if she could feel the joy of being a mother and it would mean so much to her if I would just give her one of the twins and she wasn't able to conceive. I had found this request purely ridiculous, so I told her straight up no. I wasn't willing or interested in giving up one of my twins. I told her to go adopt from home if she wanted kids that bad, but her excuse was my child would be better option since she was already blood related. I still refused it, and since then she changed, becoming a bitter, jealous person. Still, as I began interacting, I could tell she felt proud and cocky, knowing that they blackmailed me into sharing custody of the kids. Anyways, after everything, I went back home. Worried, but also trying not to think about the situation. Over the course of the first three days, all was well, and I was starting to think that maybe I was overthinking. But then the calls began coming less, and so did the text messages, until the seventh day when nothing came at all. This aroused my suspicion. I waited impatiently all day, but never once did I get one. I'd later find out why that day as I heard my doorbell ring. I opened it, and I had absolutely zero clue of who the person was. But as soon as they began speaking what they had said, what was terrifying to me, this person introduced them as Tara. She told me if how she had picked up the three kids from the highway who had later shared my address with her. And that made my heart drop. Turns out my kids had run away from my crazy mother-in-law's house. And when I saw them, I understood exactly why. Just as I thought that they did abuse them. They were littered with bruises, old and new. And once I saw this, I knew I had to push for legal action. So I called my brother, Jake. He was a great lawyer, and even though the abuse wasn't really his type of case, I still knew that he was the right one to do it. I had to request that Tara stay a while until he arrives because he needed her testimony on record, as this would be the biggest piece of evidence they've needed. After my brother got there, he asked for a recount of what happened, and Tara told him the same story that she told me. Also adding the reason why she didn't bring them to the police instead of the address they gave. Once we had that, my brother had me take pictures of the bruises that were on their bodies as proof of what exactly happened. We also asked them what happened so that we had a clear picture of their story. And apparently, at first, everything was okay. But as time passed, sister-in-law began to act more and more as if they were her children and she even went as far as to tell them to call her mommy. When they refused, continuously telling her that their only mommy was me, crazy mother-in-law joined in and also told them to call sister-in-law's mommy, saying that they would be punished if they didn't. Well, the kid still refused, even with the treatment, and the threats that this resulted in those two witches, punishing them whether it be through hitting or pinching. Every time they would refuse to call sister-in-law mommy, they'd also recounted how they would say mean things about me, telling them how I was the one who killed their daddy. 
that I was evil, that I didn't even love them, and a bag of other bullcrap. Knowing they would go this far made me assured that taking legal action would be the best option. My brother-in-law had made sure that I signed a paper to state that I'd willingly share custody, so I knew that would complicate things, but I had a plan. Not only will I pursue a child abuse case, but I'll pursue a case against my rich brother-in-law and one against my mother-in-law and sister-in-law for slander. The first plan, though, was to gather some evidence, so yeah, that's pretty much what happened. I'll keep you guys updated. Update number two. Hey guys. I noticed all the messages you've sent me and I'm truly grateful for your support. You may not know just how much this means to me, especially right now. My last update was one month ago, so I knew you must be wondering if there were any changes. So the answer to that question is yes, a lot has certainly changed. Mostly for the good though, so as you know, my kids have run away from my mother-in-law and sister-in-law. What I had done is I didn't make them aware that the kids had returned to me because my brother wanted to see if he could gather something useful. And that was a good decision because even after four days, nothing was heard from them. They didn't even try to contact me to make me aware that my children were in fact gone. Ah, oh, this showed me just how neglectful they could be. And it also served as evidence because a police report was filed in the meantime. Anyways, eventually after four days, my brother alerted the police and had them do a visit. The lying snakes had tried covering up their deeds, but with me later appearing, eventually they were forced to confess everything. I made them none the wiser. I listened as they lied to the cops, saying the kids had only disappeared earlier that day, even though I'd already told the cops that the kids had run away and come to me four days prior. Watching them lie to the cops was amusing because everyone but them was aware of their lies. At this point, I almost burst out laughing when they began crying and saying how they were planning to file a report and a bag of other bullcrap. And honestly, while it made me mad to the max that they would go this far, I also smiled because their lying to the cops about the actual situation was just perfect evidence for me to gather and use against them. Anyways, after listening to all the lies, my brother appeared with the kids in hand, along with papers from court. I wish you could have seen their face when they realized they got caught in the act. It was absolutely hilarious. They start turning all sorts of colors before they turn a deep red. All the time as the cop began questioning them and confronting them, they glared daggers at me, trying to answer and twist their original story. Eventually, the cops got tired of all their bullcrap and, well, they both got arrested. Oh. They kicked. They screamed. Saying how the cops could not listen to me because I've killed my husband. Just as I wanted to hurt my children. I honestly smiled like I've won a million dollars when they began saying all that. Because right there was the evidence I needed for the slandering case. Still. With my main priority done, I'd left with my kids telling me that I'd be seeing them in court the following week. By the time I got home, I wasn't even settled for 20 minutes before my, well, brother-in-law called. He was furious, threatening that if I don't drop the case, he would dissolve the trust, which I happily got called on record, as we would also need this as evidence in a case against him. I use this, though, as leverage telling him that if he were to dissolve the trust before the first hearing, I would make sure to pursue full actions against his wife and mother for child abuse and neglect, while also suing them for slander. It was a chance, but he fell for it. I still knew I needed more evidence on him if I wanted to make sure that I could keep the trust in place for my kids. My brother suggested that I had a private investigator dig into his business and follow him around to see what evidence could be gathered. It was a pain because it took a large chunk of my savings, but hey, it paid off. The first hearing came pretty soon and the case seems almost cut and dry because everything seems so painfully obvious to the court, yet the opposing lawyer just seemed to be twisting things about and dragging it along. 
It was honestly annoying hearing him try to bring up my husband as if to try to get something out of me, but I kept my calm knowing it was just a matter of time, as it was pretty much two different cases. I had to go to different hearings scheduled in different weeks, and while my brother-in-law was present at every single one, and from what I understood, he had to bail both his wife and mother out. And because news of the case went out, he apparently lost a business deal, so he was clearly just mad during the whole thing. The next hearing was just a few days away, and thankfully, my investigator had picked up some interesting information. From what he found, my brother-in-law seemed to frequent a certain location. He went there for questionable amounts of time, and I was quick to recognize the signs. As I was unable to keep paying the investigator, I decided to do the rest of the investigation myself, so I visit the location and what I learned and felt as if heaven had dropped the sweet pie in my lap. It was an apartment building not exactly rich class, but still upper middle class. Knocking on the door of a beautiful Asian woman, answering it, opening the door, I didn't even hesitate to start asking questions. I showed her pictures of my brother-in-law, and she had lovingly confirmed that he was indeed her partner of many years. Turns out the men were out living a whole entire double life. Not only was he engaged to this woman, but she also had two beautiful kids from him. I made sure to collect all the evidence I needed discreetly not to alert her on what I was doing. It was a bit hard, but once I had her confessing how they met and all the little important events of their life for the last few years, it was great from there on. Well, with it all on record, I had driven to my brother's office. There, he suggested that instead of exposing him in court, I should use this evidence to blackmail brother-in-law into leaving the trust fund as it was and leaving me with full custody of the kids while also getting him to testify against his mother and wife. In return, I would make sure the most of the consequences went to the mother instead of his wife, as long as he would be able to testify against her in court. It was a stretch, but I knew I had to do it. So just like that, later that day, I pulled up to his office, knowing darn well that going into his house was not much of an option. There, I could see the scowl that marred his face, and an instant I walked in, it was funny. But what was even funnier was watching his face as he checked the envelope. The envelope that had all the evidence I've gathered in picture form, it had paled as he looked at the images of him with his second family, and that's when I knew that whatever I asked from him would be mine. Just as he had stormed in and made his demands for me to share custody of my kids that day, it was exactly how I made it clear to him what I wanted in return for keeping his dirty little secret under wraps. After all, such a secret could not only ruin his marriage but also his business. My demands, well, they were simple. Give me all the rights to the trust, which couldn't be dissolved unless I agreed to it. Also, pay me a large sum of money for keeping his little secret under wraps, and also pay for all the unnecessary legal fees, give me all right and custody over my children, and finally, the nail on the coffin, testify against his mother in court. I honestly felt like an evil villain from the movies at that moment, and I didn't feel at least bit guilty, because power was addictive, and right there I literally held his whole life in the palm of my hands. I didn't even need to play the recording I had. He told me he would have his lawyer draft up some papers, but he was already behind on that. Only a few minutes after agreeing did my brother appear with a contract that he drafted himself while listening in on the whole conversation from the phone. So, just like that, he signed his soul away to me. This feels amusing writing it, but oh well. L-O-L. Anyways... After blackmailing the crap out of that dumb dude, I had to return home with my brother, so now we'll just wait until the next hearing. Update number three. So, the hearing was yesterday, and lord, may I just say it was pure drama. 
This update's going to be short, but here we go. So, I've gone to court early yesterday in preparation to see what it would play out like when all the new factors came into play, and I have to say, it certainly did not disappoint me one little bit. Firstly, I made sure to request Tara's presence so that she could testify as she was the one who found the kids on the highway. Luckily, she had a video clip from her dashboard cam, so it was absolutely undisputable. My mother-in-law and sister-in-law had turned the whole freaking color wheel watching the clip that proved they lied about the kids being missing only a day before. My brother had smoothly taken a stand at that moment to cross-examine them, and they were reduced to bumbling idiots. In total, sounding like complete morons as neither could answer the questions asked, not knowing how to twist the truth with all the evidence before them. Their lawyer had tried objecting many times to save their face, but nothing could save them with the truth before them. As the case progressed, the evidence only kept weighing heavier and heavier on them. I could see them cracking, and I knew my sister-in-law had already given up that, well, mother-in-law, she just kept on going. Yet the final straw for her was when brother-in-law took the stand. At first, she lit up like a Christmas tree, likely thinking that he'd be on her side, but the next words that came from his mouth made her grow even more pale. He confessed to her neglect and abuse of the children and also all her slander. She tried interrupting him, but was eventually gagged by the officers on the order of the judge, who had clearly grown tired of her. It was funny watching her shed these crocodile tears as she took and glared with anger, Still, seeing her in that state only served to remind me of an angry clown. She just looked plain plum crazy. The case went by smoothly as all the evidence was presented, and the judge had ruled that the jury would give the verdict two days after. So, now I'm just waiting for them. I'll be sure to update you guys when it's given. Final update. So, we're finally at the end. The verdict was given earlier today, and it ended with a surprising twist. So, just as the normal court was called in order, and previous hearing was recapped, while this happened, I had a clear view of the two suspects. Sister-in-law just looked exhausted as she cried silently, while mother-in-law looked like a hot, frazzled mess. Just from their appearances, it was clear that they had lost hope. I knew for a fact, though, that mother-in-law's sentence would be harsher than sister-in-law, so I was more focused on her as each word was said. I wondered what my husband would have thought at the moment, but I honestly didn't let it make me feel guilty, because I felt he would have wanted me to do anything it took to make our kids safe. The jury was quick to deliver the verdict, and the judge had taken it. I waited with sweaty hands and a racing heart, to see what would be delivered, and let me say, I was not disappointed. It was ruled that sister-in-law would be charged with one-year house arrest for child neglect and 1,000 hours of community service, while mother-in-law, three years house arrest, countless hours of community service, <laughs> 5,000, She'd also be fined on multiple bases of contempt for court and a few other misdemeanors. I almost laughed when the verdict was delivered because I could see the sanity slip from her eyes once it was said. Still, the surprise came at that moment. No one was able to react before she rushed at the judge, pouncing to attack as she screamed profanities and a bag of other things. I was stunned. I knew she was crazy, but who knew that chick would have a psychotic break? Still, once the scare was over and they had her completely under control, the judge revoked his original verdict and she was instead sentenced to a mental asylum. She had broken down into a weeping mess when this was said, but I expected it, as I have long known she wasn't quite right between her ears. Anyways... As for the defamation case, I decided just to throw it out. By this, I'd gotten what I wanted. So yeah, 
That was pretty much what I wanted and what happened. Thank you, everybody, for your support. I just felt so bad for OP over and over again. It just seemed like something was happening to OP. I mean, she lost the love of her life. His family after turned their back on her, especially the brother-in-law. And let's not even start to mention this toxic mother-in-law and everything that she did in the story. I just have one question for you guys. If you were in OP's position, what would you do to get this mother-in-law off your back? Guys, drop down your comments down below. Let's discuss the story. I hope you enjoyed today's content. If you're new to the channel, make sure you do subscribe so you never miss an update, an upcoming story, or just to see what the heck's going on here on Mr. Redito. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day, and until then, see ya!